Yeah, I've got the same issue with my last name. So I, yours is much easier to see and say. It's the spelling of it that's that's challenging. All right, I'm going to post this. So yours is much easier to. I'm going to post this link really quick on Twitter. And hopefully we don't have video issues that happened last time. Is your what is your uh, handle on Twitter? At the Paleo Mom. The Paleo Mom. The yeah, with the the very important the. All right, Twitter went out. I'm gonna send it to my, I've got one more thing to, one more place to, I can't do this until I get the link. So I'd love to- oh, You have to go live to, on YouTube. There are people watching this going like, why is this so boring? Right. I, I, saw, is, a lot of times I forget about that. Like we're live right like now. Hey. Boring thing I've ever seen. Totally. These Sorry. people are just standing around talking about Twitter handles. They've already, they're, they're, already, they're already done. They're already like, the good thing is you can go back and edit later and like cut out the beginning part. Do you ever do that? Uh, you know, yeah, I know you can do that. I, you know, I've tried to minimize the logistics around doing the podcast because for me, the podcast, uh, and now I'm back. Now I'm here. I'm fully here. Okay. Hey, welcome everybody, we're live. We were just hey. talking about the last minute or so of dead air. Uh, well, it wasn't dead. We were alive. Right. Uh, <laughs> Heart beating and everything. I know we can go back, but you know, for me, the podcast has really been about joy and conversations and ex exploration and adventure. And so I've really done a lot of work in trying to minimize the logistics of doing the podcast. Like I know there are certain things you need, like I need a mic and I need the headphones and I need the recording equipment. But um, if I get too caught up in the write-ups and the, in fact, I'm just doing some stuff right now to change the the uh, um, right now we so we post it in Libsyn and Libsyn has a internal website that it will use to post the the uh, article and we also then do a blog post in the whole on the whole challenge website and I just talked with my guys a couple weeks ago about about capturing the Libsyn website that Libsyn automatically does anyway right. And just iframing that in our site so that we don't have to do two versions. Well, it won't be quite as versatile and I won't be able to, you know, do some of the super niceties that I've been able to do, but it's really not about that. You know, podcasts really, I, in my opinion, aren't about that stuff. Um, although those are, although they're nice. Well, I think that uh, the majority of podcast listeners are subscribers. They find you through whatever service. They're not necessarily going to read the notes on a podcast unless there's a link that they want. Right. So it seems right. like it's much better to put the effort on the front end of the creation of the podcast than on the back end of the here's, you know, transcripts or notes or whatever. I think they, they, they serve an SEO purpose. Right. And that's yeah, no, that, I mean, that's really been my thing. Like, I, I want to keep doing this because I love doing it and I love having these conversations. And um, uh, I, I just have to keep, you know, <laughs> there's a certain production requirement that yeah. hosting a podcast requires, like blogging. You know, you have to keep doing it and <laughs> you have to do the work, right? You have to do the yeah. work. And uh, you know about that very well. <laughs> I do. There's something about blog. They don't take time off. Right. Like blogs don't, there's, there's no such thing as a, you know, vacation right. when you're a blogger or a social media personality, yeah. because uh, if you try, if you take a break, you lose momentum and momentum is everything. So you have to do like, what I do is these strategic, right? Plan everything in advance, schedule things so that at least if I'm gone, there's the appearance that I'm not gone. Right. 
right. to maintain that momentum, which, um, you know, I think of it as, uh, you know, ensuring that I still have good content so that my audience doesn't need to take vacation at the same time as I do. Right. 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 Yeah. I learned that lesson very physically when, um, we, I, I was the owner of one of the first CrossFit gyms in the country and, uh, cool. we, we, we had a team and that I was on that we, we, uh, qualified to go to the CrossFit games it, back at, this has been 2011 and the CrossFit games were 20 minutes from our gym. Like we're, we're in Santa yeah. Monica and Super you handy. down the road, right. You drive down the road to Carson and boom, there's the CrossFit games. So I thought in my night, night, how do you say night naive naivety, naivety, yeah. naivety, naivete. Naivete. There it is. I can never say that word. Uh, uh, you know, hey, we're, we're going to close the gym this weekend. And every and anybody that wants to be engaged in CrossFit will just come to the games and support the team. Right. And I, and I just, you know, I'm like, I thought that was, well, I mean, for a lot of people, that was fine. But there were quite a lot of people that were not so happy with the fact that they couldn't come in and do their workout over the weekend. And, you know, it was four days. I think we were closed. And um at first it really irked me. And then I thought, you know, they are paying us for the thing that's most important to them, which is their health and their well-being and their fitness. And if they can't show up to do it, then what do they do? Like, I, I really got it after yeah. being upset about it. Um, and so I, I understand what you're, what you're talking about with the blog. How, yeah. did you, how did you get started doing all this? Like, where did, where did this whole thing come from? Because you, you've been you know, you're, you're a force, you're a force. You're a, you know, like a, I'm, it, I'm feeling incredibly grateful that you're actually here with me. Like, wow, thank you. But you're a force to be reckoned with, with in the paleo world. And, you know, you have thousands and thousands of people that follow what you do, your wisdom and your, how did, how did this whole thing get started? Uh, so it started out of really um, needing an outlet for my enthusiasm. So I have this like medical research background. That's the like nerdy factor. So I was a medical researcher before all of this happened. Um, I was super sick. I had over a dozen different diagnosed health conditions. So when my first daughter was born and I was like trying to balance, like going back to work, now I have a colicky baby, you know, I'm like morbidly obese and borderline diabetic and I have all of these different things going on. I'm in chronic pain. And I ended up just going like, well, can't, can't do both. It's not, not a thing. And um, the National Institutes of Health have uh, a grant program specifically for women where they allow women, you have to achieve a certain uh, academic level, which I completely qualified for. Uh, and then they allow women to take up to eight years off of their academic careers. And then they pay your salary and some research grant support for three years to get back into research. Wow. This is, this is a wonderful program because women have um, career barriers, right? Especially in science um, that men don't have, right? We end up looking after sick parents. We have kids. I mean, we end up in these roles where it's just that balance is not, um, just not possible. And so this is specifically a program designed to help support women in science. So I'm like, I am going to use this program. I'm going to be a stay at home mom for, you know, five, six years. I'm going to get this kid and maybe one more. And I did end up having one more into kindergarten. And then I'm going to go back to work. And that space was amazing for me because all of a sudden I could nap when my baby who hardly slept was napping. Um, that right there, completely changed my world just to be able to, you know, at least rack up eight hours of sleep in a 24 hour period. Um, I was able to go for, we'd go for these long, she would only nap, uh, she would mostly nap on me. So I would end up trying to sleep with her for one or two of her naps. And for the other one or two of her naps, I would take her for a walk because she would sleep a lot longer if I was moving. So I would walk for two hours every single day. So I had these things that I now understand as being really, really important health inputs that were sort of starting to fall into place. Um, and then when she was one, I discovered that um, I'd had gestational diabetes in my first pregnancy. When she was one, I discovered that I was right on the cusp of type two diabetes. So my, my diet, you know, as, as much as I was working on sleep and activity diet was not a thing I was putting any effort into at the time. This is, this is what year? This was 2007. Okay, so really early. I mean, when did Lauren Cordain first publish? Uh, 2001. 
Um, I, I found paleo. It still took me a couple of years. So I found paleo in the summer of 2011. So, um, it was, you know, I ended up, um, being highly motivated by a uh, fear of type two diabetes, um, to lose weight. I followed a low carb diet and I lost hundred pounds. Um, I got pregnant with my second daughter. I skipped over the gestational diabetes and preeclampsia for the second pregnancy, which was awesome. Yep. Um, and then when she was, uh, like one and a half, um, I faced a, a huge autoimmune flare that was probably driven at least in part by my low carb diet. So I'd lost all this weight. I had normalized my blood sugars. I had uh, reduced my blood pressure. So all of the, like the metabolic syndrome all of that stuff had resolved, but I had eczema and psoriasis and lichen planus, which are all skin conditions. I was having a migraine several times a week, anxiety attacks and depression. I had uh, acid reflux, acid reflux induced asthma, irritable bowel syndrome. I had strange allergies. So I would like break out into a rash by touched cardboard, which is a very inconvenient allergy to have because cardboard is everywhere. Um, and I had chronic, uh, joint pain. And so I, um, yeah, I was miserable, right? I was, I was, I physically felt terrible. And even so I had thought I, up until that point in my life, I had thought my problem is that I'm overweight. And if I can just lose the weight, everything is going to be sunshine and rainbows. And well, and at this point you were also, you were eating well, you were following a paleolithic diet, right? You were this sleeping. Is, this is before paleo. Oh, this, this is before. Is, oh, I'm sorry. This yeah, is before paleo. This okay. is bringing me to paleo. So gotcha, I gotcha, was gotcha. following a low carb diet, um, which. Low carb like uh, South Beach type Like thing? Atkinsy. Atkinsy. Okay. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I meant. I don't know why I said South Beach. Yeah. South yeah. Beach is, I would say in the low carb umbrella, it's a little bit higher than Atkins, but uh, it was, it was um, a, a fad diet called the new Mayo clinic diet was the first huh. uh, low carb diet that I found, which was a little bit more rigid than Atkins. So it had things like have a half glass of grapefruit juice with every meal, which is interesting because it has uh, digestive enzymes in it. So like now when I look back on that diet, I go, Oh, there was some, there was some thought put into this thing. Um, but it was, uh, it, I, it merged into Atkins and then it merged into something in between, right? So um, I think I ate a little bit more vegetables than Atkins would normally have you eat, but it was still probably under 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. Right, right. And um, were you I doing had, things like checking ketones and stuff? Were you in ketosis? No, because it wasn't, a, um, I did. <laughs> I did do a ketogenic diet before it was called a ketogenic diet uh -huh. in, let me see, 2002-ish, somewhere, give or take a year. Um, and it was a, um, I did it for like three weeks and it was a like liquid uh, whey protein powder and uh, flax oil. Wow. Eight shakes a day, 1200 That's calories. Amazing. That was it. Wow. Uh, and I, I lost weight and then I stopped doing that and gained all the weight back, uh, which of course is what happens with keto because of its impacts on leptin, all things I didn't understand at the time. Right. So I have this very classic experience, despite being a medical researcher, my, um, nutrition knowledge is all self-taught after the fact. And I did what so many of us do. We, oh, look at that article. Look at that website. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, I want to lose weight. Oh, look at that before and after picture. I'm going to do that. And we don't necessarily dig any deeper. And I think one of the problems that I have with um, some of the diets that are gaining popularity right now is they have the capacity to harm. So they're not nutrient-dense diets. They, they're not nutrient-sufficient diets. They don't provide you with all of the nutrition you need. They have the capacity to permanently alter your gut microbiome in unfavorable ways. They can uh, induce all kinds of wacky hormone dysregulation. And those were things that I suffered from following a low carb diet for a few years. And all of my autoimmune diseases got worse. So I, you know, I had this, this, you know, basic metric of I weigh less, right? I'm, I'm in a healthy weight range now. And that's how so much, so many of us think of our health, right? We think of our health purely in terms of our waistlines. And that was my experience as well. And it wasn't until I was wearing long sleeves and pants to cover up 
how inflamed uh, all the different things that were going on with my skin in June in Atlanta, Georgia, when it's 90 degrees plus, right. and I was depressed and in pain. And then I was hot because of, you know, feeling like I had to cover up my skin. And it was that frustration and that low that finally had me think about my health more critically and think about, um, think about health and weight as not necessarily being the same thing. That was the beginning of finding solutions, finding paleo, finding the autoimmune protocol was hang on. I've done all of this work to lose weight and I've got all of these health conditions. Maybe being thin is not the same thing as being healthy. And that was like mind blowing to come to that realization and then having to go, okay, <laughs> If I have to choose between one of these two things, I think healthy sounds better. Um, I'm, I'm going to choose healthy. And it turns out, right, they're not mutually exclusive, but it's far more important to get healthy to lose weight rather than to lose weight to get healthy. Right. And that I had to learn the hard way. So I then I went to Dr. Google again, <laughs> like so many people do. Uh -huh. um, I had, I think it was my mom who had said something of, oh, you know, uh, so-and-so's eczema, they had to give up eggs and then their eczema went away. It's like, oh, eczema can be caused by food sensitivities. I have eczema and psoriasis and lichen planus. Maybe it's food. And so I was looking for food lists related to those three skin conditions. So there's a lot of internet sites that will give you a list for eczema. Psoriasis and lichen planus is a little bit more unusual, but I happened on an article on Professor Lauren Cordain's site this is right, June 2011. So it was three versions of a site ago. I might be on way back, but I don't, I don't know if it's accessible anymore. Um, and it was about lichen planus and the paleo diet. And this is one thing that all lichen planus sufferers think is that we're the only ones. Like it's, it's actually a relatively common autoimmune skin condition and none of us know anybody else with it. So we all think it's, it's just us. When you see an article and you're like, oh, that's the thing I have. So it just was like amazing. And then I read the list, right? Paleo in ye olden days of 2011 was always defined as what you don't eat. It was never defined as what you do. So I read through this list of no food and I had the same reaction that every single person has. That's crazy. I'm not doing that, right? Like it was like, I'm not giving up. Oh, uh, you know, even though low carb you think is being, you know, at least halfway there, there were foods on that list that I was not willing to part with. Like what were some of those foods? Um, I think it was, I mean, just the idea of not being able to cook with soy sauce or um, not being able, right. It was the idea of not being able to bread fish before I put it in the pan. Right. That just seemed like, right. From a carb perspective, that's adding very, very few carbohydrates to your meal. But I was a cooking nerd, right? I loved cooking at home. I mean, even in those days, we hardly ever ate out in restaurants because I didn't think it was worth it to pay four times as much for something I could make better at home. Mm -hmm. So I would look at those, those little things of, you know, going truly gluten-free. I did not want to give up cheese. That was a big one. Um, and these are things, right? Cheese is fully embraced on Atkins, right? right. And so I... Um, I looked at those lists and I, I just, you know, and then I read this thing about lectins and I thought that sounded crazy, but there was just enough science and there were some scientific references that I was, it was like this, this door just opened just a crack. And I could see that even though it sounded really extreme to me, that there was a scientific foundation behind this. And I was finally at the point where I needed that scientific foundation to motivate what felt like really hard choices at the time. And so I took three months reading everything that I could. Uh, Rob Wolf's uh, The Paleo Solution had just come out. Mm -hmm. So I read his book and Lauren Cordain's book. And then I started digging into PubMed and finding some of the research papers that they talk about. And I convinced myself in that three months of researching that, no, this, this is legit. <laughs> I need to try this. Um, so I, I decided to, you know, up Rob Wolf's, try it for 30 days, see how you look, feel and perform. 
I think he still says that, but that was his, his huge like mantra at the time. It's like, I'm going to try it for 90 days. I'm going to give this thing three months. And within two weeks, I started losing weight that I thought I would never lose. I lost 20 pounds in the first two months. Do you remember what the biggest changes were? Like the the, biggest changes? I mean, not Um, the biggest changes that you saw, but what were were the biggest changes in your diet that were like um, the biggest things you had to stop doing? Obviously, cheese is one of those. (laughs) Yeah, cheese, cheese. Um, You know, I I had been dealing with health problems um, and on medications for symptom management for... Um, I mean, I'd been on one medication for 12 years at that point. I was on six prescription medications at the time. And um, I had gone gluten-free as a trial at one point. Someone had said it might help. And I had gone dairy-free as a trial at one point. And someone said it would help. But going paleo was the first time I had ever gone completely gluten-free and dairy-free at the same time. Right. Uh, I think that was huge. I think upping my carbohydrate intake because I was eating more fruit and more root vegetables. I think that was huge. Um, I think uh, eating more seafood. So I, I started cooking a lot more fish uh, around that time. And I think that the omega-3 intake was probably really important there. And I continued to tinker as I continued to learn. And then as I started my website and started writing about it, um, I was very inspired by Terry Wall's TEDx Iowa City talk um, in, I think it was September, October of 2011, uh, October, I think that was very focused on nutrient density. I had never really thought about a diet in terms of micronutrients before, right? I came from that low carb, everything's about insulin perspective. Um, and so everything's about macros. Yeah. yeah I mean, everything's about percentage. every other diet's about macros, right? Right. So, um, so I tried, I started paleo almost exactly seven years ago. Uh, August 31st, 2011. Um, And within two weeks, I was able to go off all six prescription medications that I was on. Uh, My asthma went away. How did you know you could do that? Like it just, all the symptoms went away? You like, you trusted yourself? Symptoms went away and I tried, right? It was one at a time. I was like, I'm not having heartburn anymore. Let me try getting rid of Nexium. Um, I, the asthma medications were the last ones. Uh, I was like, Hey, I mean, I was on, um, medications for so acid reflux. I was on a prescription strength stool softeners for irritable bowel syndrome. How, how awesome is that? Um, <laughs> uh, and then I was on asthma medications. So the asthma medications were the last ones that I got away, uh, like stopped taking. Um, I think Nexium was the first. And then, um, yeah, I didn't, I was like, oh, hey, look, uh, bowels working again, pretty cool. They haven't worked in over a decade. So, um, so that was a thing. That's a really obvious thing. And almost everything other than right steroids for asthma, everything that I was taking was symptom management. And and this wasn't any modified version of paleo. This is paleo. Like plain old. And this was old old paleo of you know, oh, here's my list of no's, what's left? I guess, you know, right. meat and vegetables. Um, and I still, in the early days, I didn't, I didn't even do very much nuts or seeds. It was pretty much, you know, what we would call clean eating, like, yeah. right? It's, it's, it was, you know, meat, fish and, and vegetables and some fruit. Um, I started changing the fats I was cooking with. I started buying almond butter instead of peanut butter. Um, mm-hmm. I stopped making uh, burritos <laughs> with kidney beans, right? Like it was, I stopped making spaghetti. If I made spaghetti no, sauce. No tortillas, right? No more tortillas. I mean, no. Uh, so it was just, I just stopped making that as a meal. And I was doing this right, by myself, right. with my family. So. The, oh, the uh, family wasn't on board. This was not, just. You. Not initially. Huh. So initially I was cooking. It's not really two meals. So what I would do is I would make like spaghetti and I would make them spaghetti noodles and I would make myself, you know, zoodles or um, I liked cabbage. So I would do like shredded cabbage something I would do some other base instead of the spaghetti noodles or I would um you know cook a meal and they they would have dinner rolls and I wouldn't so I would just make sure that whatever was the thing that I wasn't going to eat I had my own substitute or I just didn't need right right so initially for the first few months I was just doing it by myself in my family but it was it was so revolutionary it was it felt like a miracle it felt like I've been going to doctors, including specialists for, you know, 12 years. Not one of them has ever said, 
food. Um, and here it is. All I had to do was change my diet. And these things that have been uh, very intrusive and have eroded my quality of life are like disappearing rapidly. I have never had a migraine since going paleo, except for accidentally eating dairy. So if I've been exposed to dairy, I get a migraine within 10 minutes. <sighs> Chronic migraines before any, that, right? Any dairy, like kefir or you know fermented or cheese or whatever. Correct. So I can do a cultured ghee and that's it. So any dairy protein is, is the problem. So if it's a purely protein free, but even butter has too much protein. And that, that's where I always get, that's where the, the exposure usually sneaks in because yeah. restaurants apparently don't think of butter as dairy. <laughs> I got to be honest. I don't really think of butter as dairy. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I mean, if uh, I'm going to do dairy, that's my dairy, you know, like right. I don't do much of anything else. So, uh, so, um, I mean, my mood improved, my skin started to clear up my joint pain, um, diminished. It sounds like a miracle. I mean, it's funny yeah. because you. You know, like, yeah, it sounds too good to be like you couldn't you wouldn't make a movie that is too good to be true. I, you know, it's like crazy. And it was um, because it felt like a miracle. And, you know, like, I don't want everyone to think that all their problems are going to go away in two weeks right. following a paleo right. diet. Right. I'm one of the jerks. I'm one of those horrible people that make everyone else a little bit sick because they had such miraculous results. Right. Um, you know, I've I've talked with people who've done things like followed the autoimmune protocol and gotten out of their wheelchair in three days, right? There's, there's people out there whose bodies are so hungry for the nutrients and are responding so in such an exaggerated way to the toxins and foods that as soon as you switch that balance, like everything starts to come together. And that was my body. I still had to tinker. So to really put my autoimmune skin conditions into remission, I had to go autoimmune protocol and nutrient density and uh, really dial in sleep. So like that, that whole journey took at least another year, mm -hmm. but the, the making irritable bowel syndrome disappear after dealing with it for, and going through like extensive testing, you know, um, you know, it was, there were some bad, when you poop your pants in public, there's the bad, it's just, your life is really bad at that moment. They know more. It's, just, <laughs> it's like, Oh God. Right. I and mean, I've, and I've, you know, my pe people on my podcast and people in the world who know me know that I'm not averse to talking about poop. So, uh, you know, I've had hemorrhoids. I've had major poop issues. I've had major butt issues. Uh, it is there isn't really anything worse really that, that, I, that I, that I know of, I'm sure there is something, but. Well, I mean, I guess it's not life threatening. Right. Right. It's you know, I'm not, I'm not embarrassing. Lost to walk, you know, or you know, but it's, it's at not... least I had a jacket with me at the time that I could tie around my waist and walk home. Ugh. I mean, it's fine, but um, yeah. So uh, just irritable bowel syndrome had been a big deal for me um, for 12 years, and so to have that in just two weeks, yeah, right, completely disappear. It made me a zealot. Like it made me so enthusiastic. I was obsessed. I was listening to Rob Wolf's podcast, but like doing the, like, I'm going to listen to every episode he's ever done. And he's on like episode 70 or just listen to his podcast, like all the time. Uh -huh. I, I started reading every paleo blog. I was spending more time in the scientific literature and now I'm like finding recipes and I'm starting to experiment myself in the kitchen. And what can I, what can I make for Halloween for me to have this year? And it got to the level of like inappropriate. Like I got my haircut at a great clips and I, I was telling the woman who was eating a bagel that the bagel was gonna kill her. Like it was not cool. <laughs> it was not okay. That woman did not ask me about her bagel. Right. It was, I was, but I was so like, it was, it had made such a profound difference in such a short period of time that I couldn't contain that enthusiasm and I couldn't, uh, I couldn't turn it off. My husband was sick and tired of hearing me talk about it. Um, and anytime I left the house, I mean, I was a stay at home mom at that point with a uh, almost five-year-old and an almost two-year-old. So I was also like hugely isolated. So if I got out of the house, I mean, I was like, oh, an adult to talk to, like, it was right, amazing. Right. But then I was like, oh, an adult to tell about paleo too, which yeah. was like, 
not, <laughs> not okay. And I knew, I knew when I was uh, getting my teeth cleaned and I was trying to talk about paleo while they had all the things in my mouth and I'm like, rrr, rrr, rrr. then I knew not, it's not, I need, I need an outlet. Another outlet. Yes. And, um, I ended up like on a Thursday evening thinking like, well, what if I started a website, like all of these websites I've been going to. And I looked up, you know, I researched platforms and, oh, if I do a blogger, it's, you know, it's completely free. And I said to my husband, like a Thursday evening, I was like, what do you think of the idea of me starting a blog? And he literally goes, yes, great, <laughs> do it. <laughs> And it was the Lord talking to me. Like, <laughs> he needed me to find an outlet, right? Like yeah, he needed yeah. me to have a, a place to put that enthusiasm and like the nerdy stuff, right? So I'd like read a paper and I'd be like, oh my gosh, did you know that like wheat bran can deplete your vitamin D, right? And I'd be like telling him all about this paper that I had just read. And he, he would, he's not interested in, but he's an astrophysicist. He really only likes astrophysics. He does not like biology or physiology. Like we nearly broke up over it when I went to <laughs> grad wow. school. Wow. You know, it's oh, so a thing. You, you guys have been, you guys have known each other in your journeys for a long time. Yeah, we've been together for 24 years. Wow. And married wow. for 15. Wow. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so, I've been meaning to ask you, was your training in, were you at, are you an MD or, you know, you're a PhD? I'm a PhD. PhD. Yes. Yeah. So I have a PhD in medical biophysics. So I wanted to be a medical researcher from the time I was seven. My uh, grandfather was a biochemist and did cancer research. And so he was a huge influence in my life. That's how I knew that research scientist was a job. So when people wow. would ask me as a seven-year-old, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Research scientist. And they would look at me like, <laughs> this kid's crazy. Yes. People still look at me like that though. So I don't know. <laughs> but um but yeah, so I, that was something that I wanted to do from a very young age. And it was just a question of, you know, which field I ended up doing uh, my first, uh, first year is general sciences in university. So you have to take biology, chemistry, physics, calculus, English, and computer science. And um, I was planning on doing biochemistry like my grandfather, but I just did not have great professors for biology or chemistry. And I had an amazing physics professor. So I ended up deciding to do physics instead. And so I switched majors and ended up doing a honors physics degree. Um, and uh, for my honors thesis, I did um, I did radiation therapy in a cancer institute. I wow. did a, a research paper that was published out of that. And so um, I ended up applying for biophysics departments all across Canada, uh, thinking, you know, at the time, right? Oh, you know, I'll just have to go to whoever accepts me. And then I got accepted at every single school with scholarships. So I ended up doing a like three week long tour of six institutions in Canada, meeting the departments, meeting potential advisors. And then I fell in love with this like physiology project inside a medical biophysics department at the University of Western Ontario. Wow. So the reason why it was in a biophysics department was because of the tools they were using, not because of the project itself. So it was a vascular surgery research laboratory, which was super cool. And I ended up having to teach myself all of the biology, physiology, anatomy, organic chemistry in order to be able to do my project, which was an amazing experience because I basically taught myself an entire bachelor's degree or bachelor's degree and a half worth of background material that I had to know in like depth enough to defend my thesis. Um, and so it was amazing practice at, um, being, having to, to teach myself a field, which I've you know been able to apply since I actually switched. My first postdoctoral research fellowship was in a sort of very similar field. I sort of went from liver research to lung research, but was still looking at systemic inflammation uh, and uh, the ways that the body tries to control inflammation. Very, very relevant to what I do now. Yeah, right. um, and then I went into cell biology. So I then I had to like, ah, oh, I have to care about what's inside a cell now. So I had to teach myself basically a master's in cell biology in order to be able to do that research. But that was really cool because I ended up characterizing a new tumor suppressor gene that's really important in epithelial cell health. So it's a uh, high risk or mutations are a high risk for breast cancer and colon cancer. But I learned, I was actually looking at tight junction formation because this particular cancer suppressor gene impacts tight junction proteins. 
you just lost about 90% of the audience. I did. But so this is where it's relevant. Because but you, you know, you make it so, you make it look so easy and it just goes <laughs> out of you and you're smiling and like, it's wonderful as, as if we're talking about, you know, buttered butter on your toast. Right. So, but okay. So this is why it's super cool. So I studied the immune system and when the immune system gets super stimulated that it starts attacking the body. Uh -huh. um, I studied it in the context of what happens in ICUs when people start crashing, right? So it's called systemic rejecting. Spot syndrome, sepsis, multiple organ yeah. failure, acute respiratory distress syndrome. They're all in one family of, uh, sometimes it's with an infection, sometimes not, but it's basically your immune system is so overstimulated by the original injury that other things are being damaged by your immune system. Mm -hmm. So very, very relevant to understanding the low level damage that systemic inflammation causes that's linked to diabetes or cardiovascular disease, or understanding how the immune system can attack in a more targeted way in autoimmune disease. So like a very, very relevant background. And then getting into epithelial cell biology, that's gut health because the lining of our gut for entire small intestine is these epithelial cells and they're very specialized cells. They have a top and a bottom. And the thing that, that the, the structure that divides the top and the bottom is called a tight junction. And all of these foods that are eliminated on the paleo diet one of the major rationales is because they contain compounds that impact the tight junction and make the gut leaky. And that, of course, then stimulates the immune system. So I was able to take this background. It never had, none of the research I did had a nutrition component. Mm -hmm. Self-teach myself the nutrition component, but then take this amazing background and understanding how these cells work to form a, a semi-permeable barrier in the gut, right? And, and why that's important. And what happens when that you know, goes awry and take this incredible information about how the immune system's working and how the body naturally tries to control the immune system and just insert the nutrition component, insert the lifestyle component. And then I can have this super detailed understanding of the best diet and lifestyle strategies for optimal health from a gut health perspective and an immune health perspective. And I've self-taught myself a lot more about hormones and other systems. And then distill that for, you know, I nerd out because clearly, <laughs> clearly this is fascinating stuff, but then yeah. I can distill that for, for the average person to read. It's one of the reasons why I write such long articles. It's one of the reasons why my books are so long because I don't dumb things down. I take that information and I just take the time to explain it because I remember being a graduate student reading papers with a medical dictionary beside me so that I could understand all of the jargon because I came from a physics background and then went and did a physiology research project. So that experience not only gave me this fantastic background for reading the science and understanding it and being able to integrate it, but it also gave me the experience that I needed to be able to write about it in a way that's accessible because I, I have this very vivid memory of what the heck is a leukocyte. It's a white blood cell. It's a type of white blood cells. But like, I just, I, you know, I, it took me days to read each paper when I first started trying to bring myself up to speed in the field that I was going to do my PhD research in because of the jargon. Right. So I have this, this way of being able to write where I use the jargon, but use an explanation yep. and then give you a way to learn that jargon. Cause I think it's really important to learn the, the technical terms but then also like, here's, here's the real world, what this actually is and why it's important. I love how your life kind of just set you up for this. You know, like, I love how you're training with no knowledge of what you were eventually going to do. I love, you know, you like, you got sick, you had your kids, like all these things that were seemingly unconnected were really connected. Like now that if you go back and look at it, yeah. you can trace the line and go, holy crap, it's not only a meandering line. It's not really meandering at all. It was like a rocket ship, you know? I mean it's true. And it's one of those things that, um, you know, I, so I had to decide a couple of years ago, I was like, my eight years are up, but I have already started this website. I've written a couple of books. Am I going to go back into academia? I can. There's a lab uh, here in Atlanta doing some really interesting uh, research that I could plug right into with my background. But it also, it, it's interesting to me now with, with the added information that I have from all of the reading that I've done over the last few years. Um, am you know, am I going to do this? And I, I hit this point where, um, 
I just felt like I'm where I'm supposed to be. What I'm doing now, it's not, it's not just that my, it's not just my background, my experiences that have brought me here. It also integrates things that no other career could integrate. I love cooking. I get to develop recipes and put them in cookbooks. Like I wouldn't be able to do that in academic lab. I love drawing. I get to do my own technical illustrations. So all of my technical illustrations in my books, I've drawn myself. Um, I write, I, I guess music. I haven't figured out how to integrate music yet. Um, that's that, but you know, everyone has a have to have a hobby too, right? Gotta have a hobby. Gotta have um, a hobby, right? I do improv theater as a hobby, which translates to all the public speaking that I do now. What so kind of music, I, what kind of music do you play? What is, do you have a background? I, uh, so I grew up playing violin. So classical. Wow. Yeah. I grew up playing the trumpet. I, I played oh, for cool. 18 years. I went to the Eastman school of music actually. <laughs> Fantastic. So yeah, uh, I, yeah, I just played um, it very seriously. And then I gave it up when I joined the Marines and my whole, the different life started. I did the whole, um, you know, I was practicing four hours a day in high school. Um, I was part of uh, a symphony and a youth orchestra mm -hmm. and doing festivals. And I had to decide, am I going to pursue a career in science or a career in music? Cause I love them both equally. Right. And someone, I don't even remember who it was. It might've been my mom. It's often my mom. My mom's full of good words of wisdom. I <laughs> said, uh, well, one of those makes a much easier hobby than the other. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great quote. I love that. Yeah. And it, it's true, right? It's, it's so much easier to have music as a hobby, even if you just become an active listener. And now my kids do piano lessons. So mm -hmm. even I tried to get one of them to play the violin. Neither one of them were interested. They both wanted piano. It's fine. I happen to think they made a poor choice, but we're okay. <laughs> it's right, but we'll forgive them. <laughs> um, but you know, they're, they're now, um, they, they're both, uh, excellent little pianists and they play a lot of the same repertoire that I grew up learning and I get to right. I'm an active, I'm, I'm one of those parents who like sits with my kids while they're practicing and helps them. Right? I get, so I get music that way now, even though I don't play very much anymore, but it's still a, a yeah, we have a lot in common that way. Like I do that with my son. He, I have to get him to do it more than it sounds like your kids. Um, he never really wants to practice. He never, he's a, he's a little sport, sporty spice. So we have, uh, um, practicing is an obligation. It's right. not an option. Right. So I grew up playing Suzuki method uh, uh -huh. and my kids are doing mixed methodology, but they're following the Suzuki repertoire. And one of the Suzuki philosophies is you don't have to practice every day, only on the days you eat. <laughs> There so <laughs> that's what I tell my kids. Right. Oh, you have a stomach bug? You don't have to practice today. Right. That's it. How that's, cool is that? <laughs> you know, I wanted to ask you, going back, bringing it back to um, uh, the conversation that we were having about your background and your credibility. Um, it's funny. I, I, I uh, regrammed your post the other day where you, um, I don't remember what you, it was a, you had a picture of a jar of coconut oil and it's mm -hmm. like, I don't know. Poison. The article, because the article came out last week that said, you know, coconut's horrible for you, and here's yeah. one. And I regrammed it, and one of my friends from college, um, um, you know, heck, I, I, he wasn't heckling. Well, he was heckling, um, but you know, and, and this is something that that I face, and that I'm sure you've faced over the years. He's like, hmm, paleo mom versus Harvard, P Harvard MD which should I choose? Which should I follow? Which advice? Like, as if, Hey, you idiot Patronic, why are you, why are you posting this information from someone who obviously doesn't know what they're talking about? Paleo right. mom. Like, what does she know? How, I mean, have you gotten that a lot and how do you, how do you deal so, with it? To start with, um, there's, uh, a misogyny still in science that I have battled for a long time. Yeah. And as a woman in science, I had to work three or four times harder than any of my male peers. Um, so there's there's an aspect to this that I'm just sort of used to, um, the, the aspect of having to be more thorough, of having to work harder, of having to do more in order to be successful. Um, so, I mean, that's a, that can go down a whole tangent of the, um, you know, gender inequities in science and corporations and all of that thing that I have a whole pile of thoughts about. <laughs> um, so that that's the start. And I've seen silly things like um, 
oh, you know, well, she, you know, she's not a real scientist because I have a PhD um, or, uh, well, she didn't, you know, she didn't publish. Well, numb nuts. I published under my maiden name, like most female scientists and smart on you for looking that up. Cause it's been on my about page for le- like six years, but all right. Um, so I've, I've had, uh, experiences like that. Um, but I think when it comes to right people who, who know me, who follow me, follow me for the science. That's the thing that they love. Um, the problem is probably in the paleo mom branding. And I have gone back and forth of, do I become Dr. Sarah Valentine.com? I probably should at some point, um, to help reinforce authority on the internet. Um, but when I started this website, I didn't, I really didn't realize how much I couldn't turn the science in me off. Um, I really thought that I was documenting my experience, transitioning my husband, transitioning my kids. Um, I was in, you know, I was a stay at home mom at the time that felt like my whole world. And I, I thought it was going to be a lot more of a personal journey type blog. Um, but then I'm a super nerd and have this great scientific background. And I, I ended up writing from this scientific, science or scientific perspective, um, like a science translator right from the very beginning. I mean, right from my very first blog post without really intentionally doing it. So yeah, the, the it failure kinda, was more on me recognizing out. what it was going to be. It just oozes out of you. I mean, like, it's like, it's, it's obvious when we start talking about stuff and the way you, you know, like you just sprinkle little things in that are, you know, like using conjunctions to most of us and to you, they're just part of your vernacular, which yeah. is, yeah. And you can't I mean, I, help it. I, um, <laughs> I think I'm I'm not just a scientist by training, right? I'm a scientist by nature. I think through every problem algorithmically. I love learning and I love learning about all kinds of things. I'm just curious. Um, I think the internet is amazing. I love having the entire world in my pocket at all times because in the olden days, I'd have to wait until I had time to go to the library and look it up in an encyclopedia. And now I can just say, hey, Siri, nope, nope, don't. Oh yeah. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean it right now. Right. No. You're fine. You don't. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I think, you know, people who are actually fam- take the time to familiarize themselves with me, understand my credentials and my authority in the field. Um, you know, people who just see the handle and assume I'm a mom who feeds my kids paleo, um, you know, they don't they don't get it. And that's fine. They're either people who are interested in learning more and will check it out. They'll click on that article and read it and see the references and go, oh, no, wait, this is legit. Right. Or they won't. And if they're not, you know, yes, I should probably figure out how to rebrand. But at the same time, we are sort of faced right now with this. Um, there's a little bit of a anti-science culture. Um, answers come so easily to us now. We've sort of lost as a society, this ability to really think critically. Um, And most people are not willing to accept information that's contrary to their beliefs. And that's, that's not my, that's not the person I'm, I'm not trying to talk somebody into paleo. This is not the days where I'm telling the hairdresser that the bagel is going to kill her. I am providing information for the people who are looking for it. So I'm not trying to recruit that person who's thinks that the Harvard professor who conflates medium chain triglycerides with long chain saturated acids is obviously the authority, even though he's completely wrong. Like I just, you know, like that person is not ready for accurate information. They've got their beliefs that this is the way it is. So um, I think that it's far more important to provide accurate information for the people who are looking for it, especially, you know, in a world where the internet is not, you know, it's not policed. There's no quality control. And I completely believe that it should stay that way. But until we can, as a society, sort of relearn in this current context, those critical thinking skills, the ability to tell pseudoscience from science, from complete BS on the internet, um, like until we've got that, having trusted sources is really the, the, 
the best way, right? Have my five, you know, websites that I go to for answers. And I would like to be one of those websites. The yeah. only way I can be one of those websites is by being incredibly thorough and meticulous in my research. Yeah. You know, it's, um, I think it's never been more true that, uh, you know, Dr. Google is a very dangerous place. I mean, you can, you can, you can back up any argument you have, any side of any argument you have based on articles you find in Google. It's just, yeah. totally uh, so you end I up, mean, a lot of people just end up continuing to believe what they've always believed because Google said, Google, look, here's an article. It says that, you right. know, da, 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 da. Well, and um, what we do, I mean, this is probably in part human nature, but we specifically seek out uh, those articles, those perspectives that reinforce our point of view yep. rather than challenge it. And one of the things that has happened, I mean, while, you know, Twitter can be a, certainly a area full of confrontation, it's one side versus the other side without constructive debate, right? It is, uh, you're wrong, I'm right. No, you're wrong, I'm right. And we've lost this ability to, I mean, obviously not all of us, but I think as a society, we tend to not take in information and process it and figure out how that fits with our beliefs and then decide what we're gonna do with that. And that's one of the things that I was trained to do as a scientist was not to dismiss a study because it doesn't conform with my beliefs. To think about, evaluate, and not just trash it as, well, obviously that study was poorly done. Oh, I had a small sample size or they didn't do a crossover design or whatever the critique of that study is to not dismiss this. It's gone through the peer review process. It might have flaws. Actually, almost every study does, but let's look at the information and let's try to understand the context and let's integrate that if needed, right? So we can go, look, I've read these five papers Four of them show this, one of them show this. I think this one time is this context. That's really interesting. These four times is this other context. That's really interesting. And we can create a nuanced, detailed picture that's far more helpful and relevant when we accept the full picture of information and allow ourselves to change our opinions on something, to change our conclusions um, and to eventually, I mean, ideally in science, you want to reach consensus, um, but that can take years, decades, and it's okay to meander a little bit on our way to consensus. Yeah, you know, I think um, you bring up some really, really important points. Um, you know, I think some of the things that contribute to that in the modern world are, are the speed at which we're operating and the lack of time we give ourselves to actually think. Yeah. Like we read something, you know, it's funny because I was just exploring the notion myself that I've been, I've been following, follow, falling into that trap uh, by thinking, hey, I need to learn how to read faster. I need to speed read because I need to get through more books. I mean, there's so many books I have on my reading list. I'm sure people can relate to this. Like I've got- I have a pile on my bedside table. Yeah, I've got piles of books. I've got Kindle. My, God knows how many books I've bought on my Kindle that I've not read. Right, um, I definitely have some of those too. I mean, it's an endless list. I can go on vacation for the next, you know, three months and not finish all my books. And uh, so I, I got to learn how to speed read. I got to go faster. And, and um, someone just challenged me on that uh, a few weeks ago. They're like, is it really how much you read? Is it really the quantity or is it the time that you spend with what you read to really integrate it into your thinking and the way you're processing? Do you really need more information at this point? You know, I love that. Yeah, like, yeah, I'm like, oh God, that that <laughs> just that just had a little butterfly ripple in my whole you know universe. Like, oh God, if I really let that expound out, that can change a lot of things. But I also love what you said about sort of time to contemplate, and you know, you think about our society now. Even if you go for a walk you're going with your phone in your pocket and you're maybe listening to a, you know, a podcast or, Guilty. you know, you're, you're, right? <laughs> I, did I did it this morning. I did it this morning. I had Jordan Peterson go on this morning as I walked around the neighborhood. <laughs> but in the olden days, right? Pre iPhone. Uh, so only 10 and a half years ago, yeah, right. you would have gone for a walk and just been in your head. And you would have noticed the funny squirrel, you know, or you would have um, said hi to a person you passed on the street, right? Like 
and you would have just been thinking about something, right? And we don't give ourselves the time. That's not just processing new information, but just processing our experiences. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at the mindfulness research is so powerful and really what it is, is going back to time where you allow yourself to just be with yourself and think about, you know, thinking about how do I feel about this thing instead of just reacting um, or, um, you know, you daydreaming, right? Thinking about bigger questions, getting philosophical in your own head, um, giving ourselves that time to, wow, that was really cool, that thing. Even if it ends with, when I get home, I'm going to look this thing up, right? That, that series of, you know, that thought progression is something that we don't often give ourselves the time to do. We're watching TV and I do the same thing. If I'm cooking dinner, it used to be very meditative. I'd sit there chopping vegetables and I would just be in this like repetitive motion in my own head, trying, you know, obviously not to cut off my own fingers, but so far so good. Yeah. Um, and now I throw on a podcast mm -hmm. and I make it, it's just a different experience, right? And I, I think that there's still room for consuming media and, and adding information, but at the same time, how do we, we need to get back to protecting time where we're not connected. Um, and I can say this because I just got back from the mountains from a weekend where my, I had no cell service. So I was like forced into being like disconnected from the world and it was lovely. Um, but I'm back now. So like the twitch is gone. Right. Totally. <laughs> but I think that if we can do those like mini technology breaks every single day, yeah. I think we can really improve um, not just our sort of mental health, but our like emotional intelligence. Yeah. I mean, giving ourselves time to figure out what do I believe? I read this. This is like, like the thing that I just mentioned about the books. Like, okay, that's great. That's this guy's opinion. Yeah. You know, like, do I believe that? Like, I can't just read that and go, hey, that's a cool idea. I think I should stop, slow down and stop reading. And, you know, like, I mean, I could do that. That's typically what I would do because <laughs> I would be on to the next chapter and right. then the next book and then the next thing. And they, um, but giving ourselves that, that time to figure out what, what we believe and then how, what we, what we are, what we stand for, you know, I mean, this goes in much deeper conversation about values and, and philosophy and mission and, you know, having a personal mission statement. I mean, it, like it, 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 it's a wormhole that, you know, um, but I, it's so valuable and it's, we, it's at the speed that we're operating these days, uh, you know, the speed that technology forces us to live into uh, you know, like the new iPhones coming out next week and then the new Apple watch and then the new, you know, God, there's always something new in technology. I mean, there's always something new around nutrition, like new, a new study that comes out, you know, there it's, a, it's an onslaught of like a conveyor of just, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that wasn't a fart. Uh, for no, all it was conveyor is, is what it was. It was exactly. I mean, you've heard conveyors that sound like totally, absolutely. <laughs> Whole Foods every week. Um, but I also, at the same time, and I think this is where maybe I set myself apart from other sort of thought leaders within the paleo community, is that I find that new information incredibly exciting because it adds to our understanding and it allows me to, you know, sometimes something is so monumental that you do reframe everything else that you had known about that subject up to that point. And that to me is why the paleo diet itself is so different from any other dietary framework is because it respects the scientific evidence and is open to evolution as we learn more. So the paleo diet today does not look exactly like the paleo diet from five years ago or 10 years ago, or when Lauren Cordain's book came out first, right? 17 years ago, and he recommended canola oil and diet Coke, right? So like the paleo diet now, uh, it has this nutrient density focus. It has this sort of plant-based diet focus. So yes, meat is still embraced, but we understand the importance of really high vegetable consumption. Um, we have this fat quality focus, which canola oil most assuredly was not. Um, we have embraced a uh, whole food carbohydrates. We're not afraid to eat fruit anymore. Um, 
We've also realized that nuts are great in smaller quantities and maybe we shouldn't eat the five pound Costco bag of almonds every single week by <laughs> ourselves, right? So, but like- I have, these, I have these nuts. Have you ever had Barucas? Yes. They, they're like a almond and a, and a peanut had a baby. Yeah, and they, are, and they are super high in fiber. And they're, the only downside is they're incredibly expensive. So what I end up doing is I have, jar, I have a jar of Barucas on the counter. I have a jar of pistachios and a jar of, of uh, like mixed nuts from Costco. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'll have, I'll take a little bit of uh, Barucas and then I'll mix it with a little bit of, oh, yeah. so, I don't, so I don't like eat Go myself crazy. in like, the poor house uh, and get so much fiber that I don't, you know, my, my system doesn't know what to do. Hey, Alyssa, I want to ask you, where do you stand on, um, and I, 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 I know I always run the risk by asking you a science type question of this could take. You I'm ready not, for some jargon for 20 minutes? <laughs> 20 minute rant pre probiotics yeah. and and the importance of fiber carnivore like where where are you in that continuum <laughs> so i happen to be writing a gut health book that's all focused on the microbiome right now wow. so wow. this is totally my jam i'm literally reading like 10 papers a day in my my research and those 10 papers will turn into like two paragraphs but it's fine right. um so I am just immersed in the scientific literature on the role of the gut microbiome. And I, uh, I think fiber should be recharacterized as an essential nutrient. Um, I think calling it non-essential is really missing a incredibly important input to our health, which is we need to consume fiber to feed the right types of bacteria in our guts. Now, that being said, we do have bacteria that eat proteins. We do have bacteria that eat fats. So like they will, you will still have, if you went on a carnivore diet, you would still have bacteria in your gut. It's just that the strains that have the most beneficial health effects uh, are the th strains that thrive in a high fiber environment. And we're seeing that certain foods are uniquely beneficial for the gut microbiome. So, um, and this is, this is where I'm gonna say some like paleo controversial things. Um, so vegetables are obviously amazingly important. Mushrooms are uniquely beneficial. So mushrooms go on top of just eating a lot of vegetables. Vegetables of the cruciferous family are uniquely beneficial. So that goes, you know, making sure we have some broccoli and cabbage and kale and whatever on top of eating a lot of vegetables is really important. Uh, tea and coffee, interestingly enough, everyone's going to love this one, uniquely beneficial for the gut microbiome. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, insects, uniquely beneficial for the gut microbiome. So cricket bars, uh, you know, wow. awesome. right? Isn't that fascinating? And oats, here's where I have something that's not paleo, but wow. oats are uniquely beneficial for the gut microbiome. Um, then um, other important factors, moderate saturated fat. Uh, so having high saturated fat intake actually skews the microbiome towards more gram negative uh, bacteria, which are uh, the ones that are more inflammatory, like E. coli. They're not all E. coli, but that entire class of bacteria have proteins in their cell membrane that are inflammatory. And if you have uh, an imbalance and you have more gram negative than gram positive bacteria in your gut, you have this basically like just well of inflammatory stimulus in your gut at all times. And if you consume saturated fat or alcohol, that helps bring those compounds into the body. So moderate saturated fat intake, omega-3s are really, really important. So high omega-3s, really, really important. So lots of seafood. Vitamin D status fascinatingly impacts what species want to live in your gut. Wow. So getting your vitamin D levels tested and supplementing if you're low, really, really important for gut health. And then uh, exercise increases the diversity in your gut. Very, very important. Getting enough sleep is really, really important for increasing diversity in your gut and managing stress. So we can actually tie in all of these lifestyle factors that are also part of right the paleo lifestyle and almost all of the diet, right? Yep. The, the oats were not. Um, and How do these things, so going back to the like prebiotics and probiotics, mm -hmm. Where do these fit into that equation? Because I've, I've, I had, um, I had uh, Dr. Perlmutter on and we talked mm -hmm. about how, you know, his definition was prebiotics feed the microbiome, 
probiotics uh, are the microbiome. Are the micro- are, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so where, where do those fit in that? All of these things are food for bacteria. So uh, all they're all the prebiotics. And okay. what is important to get, it's really important to get prebiotics from food and not from a supplement. And that's because different type of bacteria like different food. And if you take a supplement, if you're taking you know, inulin fiber or uh, resistant starch as a supplement, you're really taking one kind of food in a concentrated way. So you are feeding a limited group of bacteria and missing out on the diversity part of the equation. So the one thing we know about a healthy gut microbiome is the more species in there, the better. So ideally we should be looking at 1,000 to 1,500 different species of microorganisms in each one of our guts. Um, people who are really, really sick might have 60 to 100 different species. People who follow very low fiber diets, right? You're talking about, again, sort of 60 to 100 different species. And that is linked with cancer, cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, kidney disease, autoimmune disease, um, asthma, allergies, right? We can link every chronic illness to problems in, with the balance in our gut bacteria. So we know diversity is the number one thing that's important. And the way that we get diversity is with diversity of food. We're getting exposed to different species of bacteria through like things like wild fermented foods, right? Like sauerkraut or kombucha or kefir. We're getting exposed by just being outside about not freaking out that there's organic dirt on my organic carrots and not feeling like you have to scrub that off. Like a little bit of dirt's actually really good for us. Um, and I think that probiotics as a supplement certainly have a time and a place. There's mixed research on whether or not those really seed the, the gut microbiome or whether they kind of do their good thing passing through. But if you're dealing with you know, a severe lack of diversity and undergrowth, taking a bro- probiotic supplement may be the thing that sort of pushes you, you know, down the path. Because the other thing is we know that there's cross feeders. So this is really cool. So there's this group of bacteria that ferment fiber and this other group of bacteria that eat the products of the fiber fermentation from the first bacteria. So if you don't have this group of bacteria, they're called keystone species because they're so important. They create an environment that lets this group of bacteria live. And this group of bacteria is those lactobacillus and bifidobacterium that are in every single supplement. But if your gut doesn't have this group of bacteria, a lot of soil-based organisms like bacillus strains fall under this group, then you can take all the supplements in the world. You're never going to get these guys to actually seed and grow. And how do you get the keystone guys to show I mean, up? Don't this, have- is where, this is where playing outside, super important. Um, going to a local farm, the insects out of the dirt and, uh, (laughs) sure. I mean, that's, that's (laughs) that's one way to do it. Um, I mean, wild edibles is an amazing source of probiotics. Um, especially if you want to take those home and ferment them and concentrate the strains, right? If you want to take your wild onions and ferment them, that's such an amazing thing. It's a lot of work, right? We're not used to doing things like that. Um, but just being outside playing in the dirt, touching dirt. Um, so if you, you know, you touch good quality, right? Not depleted soil, but like organic soil from you were in the woods and then you start touching your mouth, you're actually seeding your gut microbiome. You're seeding first your mouth microbiome, but that then translates to your gut microbiome. So you're, you just need to be around it really to be exposed. You don't need to like go into the woods with a shovel. <laughs> yeah. And like bury yourself or, you know, yeah. Um, or just, uh, take it home to, to sprinkle in some, you know, water or whatever. Um, and so, I mean, there are, right. There are also some supplement brands that are starting to focus more on these keystone species and less on the sort of classic probiotics that we know are really important, but we know are also sort of really hard to get to grow if they don't want to. I'm experimenting right now. It's funny, you, you, all the things you just said, you know, I just had my, my, my uh, gut tested and I'm very low I'm in species mm. diversity. And I, I'm experimenting with a new supplement. It's called Seed. Um, and uh, don't know, you know, I won't really know anything until I go back and- And retest, yeah. And, and poop in the little dish and, you know, get that all My out. favorite thing. Wonder, wonderful. <laughs> you know what? Infinitely better than pooping in your pants. Uh, yes, you're right. 
You're right. It's, Infinitely better. I hadn't really thought about that. The uh, option for, you know, not the option, but the, no, the alternative. No. And, but uh, con yeah. Context, context here. Yeah. Yes, totally. Well, I'm looking at the clock and I know, you, you know, like there are 15 more questions that I could, <laughs> there are probably 300 more questions I could ask you. Right. Um, but you know, the way to get those questions answered is for me to sit down and do a little work and read your website. Cause they're all there. Most of the answers are there. I really do try. I mean, there's certain, I sometimes surprise myself when I, you know, realize, okay, how did I never cover this in a, in a blog? I mean, I still write a new article every single week for my website because there's still topics. They're either like the coconut is pure poison thing that just needs a, a thorough rebuttal or they're topics that you know, I'm, I'm still learning. I mean, this is the fun thing, right? Like I'm writing a microbiome book because I felt like that was a weak spot in my knowledge and what better way to force myself to understand it in intricate yeah, detail than write a book about it. Right. Um, and so that means that I have a whole pile of, of um, blog articles that are coming down the pipeline that are related to the microbiome. Awesome. And so I, um, you know, I would say it's, it's maybe not as thorough as Wikipedia. <laughs> Yeah, Granted, there's just me. Yeah, just you. Yeah. But, um, so we're so tell me, tell people that are listening where the best way to engage with you, find you, um, learn from you, et cetera. Well, so my website is thepaleomom.com, at least for now until I get around to rebranding. Mm -hmm. um, thepaleomom.com. And from there, you can link to my social media sites. I'm very active on Instagram and Pinterest and Facebook. I'm less active on, on Twitter. Um, because I like to engage in constructive debate <laughs> and, uh, the character limit there is a little bit, uh, and obviously I don't talk short, so <laughs> right. the 280 characters, I feel like I can get half a sentence out. I can't really, like, I can't really believe there was a time when it was only 140 characters. Like I, I get, right. I get maxed out a lot at 280. I'm like, that's why I never use Twitter. I think, I mean, well, I, if you look at my Facebook posts, I mean, they can be like a thousand words. <laughs> I, I've seen so that doesn't, that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't translate to Twitter. Have you ever hit the limit in Instagram? You can hit the- Oh yeah, all the time. Cause yeah, Instagram's that's 2,200 characters. Yeah. So I didn't uh, ever actually know that limit. So it yeah. So yeah. I will often have a similar post on Instagram that is severely edited down to like a longer post on Facebook. Right. So I would say more thorough stuff is on Facebook. Instagram's a little bit more personal. So Instagram's a little bit more where you might see what I'm eating for lunch or- something that my kid is doing. Um, so I definitely share more personal stuff on Instagram. So it's definitely, if you're on both platforms, follow me in both places. And your, um, your but, new book is, what's your new book called? Oh, let me show it to you. Cause I happen to have props. <laughs> it's awesome. called Paleo Principles. It's a little bit thick. It weighs it six looks, and a half you know, pounds. The size and the shape yeah. and the hard coverness of it feels like, hey, am I going back to school? A little bit, a little <laughs> bit. Um, <laughs> So this is, I mean, I tooting my own horn a little bit, but it really is the most comprehensive paleo guidebook uh, ever created. Wow. Um, and it goes through, one of the things that I did in this book, it was really important to me as a scientist was to admit the boundaries of human knowledge. So I go through a lot of like, how, how do we evaluate the merits of a particular food? So how do we, um, you know, how do we say, one food's good or one food's bad. What, what's the criteria? And really explaining that criteria. And then going through the foods that are like unequivocally healthy and form the basis of an optimal human diet, nutrient sufficiency, and all of those concepts are wrapped right in, gut microbiome, all of those things. Um, and then go through the foods that are unequivocally not gonna help anyone, right? That are just, they're either empty calories or they're like uniquely harmful. And then I have a whole section on everything that's in between that the science isn't cut and dried. These are foods that might work for some people that might not work for others. And what's interesting about that section in this book is that some of those foods are foods that are classically considered paleo. And I've put them in this gray area section like vegetables of the nightshade family, like tomatoes. They're actually really inflammatory. And then there's other foods in there that have been classically considered not paleo, like traditionally prepared legumes or gluten-free grains. So there's, there's both of those. I would consider them foods that are, you know, worthwhile experimenting with to, to figure out our own bio-individual responses to. Yeah. And so they get their whole own, own section with a, you know, here's the protocol for 
before figuring out if these work for you. Here's the symptoms to watch out for and really giving people those tools. Then I go through lifestyle. I go through stress management, activity, sleep, uh, human connection and social connection. You're going through the whole life chat. I mean, this is our, this should be our guidebook. And what are you doing writing our book? <laughs> I can I mean, license it. The, whole, the lifestyle, the lifestyle part, you know, it's yeah, all, no, uh, it's all in there. Yeah. Um, even, awesome. even into like nature therapy and things like that. And the really amazing studies that have been done that quantify the benefits of nature time. Like that's really cool scientific research. And then there's 230 recipes and 20 meal plans, wow. which is really why the book's so thick. I got to get a copy of this book for God's sakes. Why is, it should be sitting right here on my counter. Available in uh, bookstores worldwide and on uh, cool. all your online retailers. Uh, okay. I'm going to cut you off. Cause you said you had a hard stop at 10 30 and it's 10 29. So <laughs> there we go. thank you so much for spending the time for, for just being you. Like I, I just am so uh, grateful that you have taken the path that you've taken and that you're doing what you're doing in the way that you're doing it. Because I think the paleo mom, as much as it might not be as scientifically accurate, um, it, it, you're, you're, you're approachable in a way that you wouldn't be if you were Dr. Sarah Ballantyne and, and you're influencing people's lives that re and you're really making a difference. Oh, thank you so much, Andy. I really had fun hanging out with you. Cool. Well, we'll, um, we'll talk soon. I'm sure. Keep, yeah. Wait one second. I'm going to stop the YouTube.